Welcome everyone to the October 2020 uh, Integration Down Under. Um, hopefully most people aren't in Melbourne in the middle of the lockdown, but um, I know that uh, some of the areas we, Six Pivots got a lot of people that are based in Brisbane, so they're kind of getting more towards a normal side of things. So the organizers for Integration Down Under are Martin Abbott, Dan Toomey, Renee Brower, uh, Wagner Silvera, and myself here in Melbourne. Um, we have lost a MVP in Australia um, because Martin has now joined uh, Microsoft as in Perth. So he had to give up his MVP, but he's still going to be involved in the integration down under. So uh, congratulations to Martin on that uh, joining Microsoft or as most MVPs call it, going to the dark side. Um, let's see. Um, tonight, I am the speaker. So um, be talking about the integration of services announcements from Ignite 2020 with some demos. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, it's all going to be recorded. So if anybody misses it, they can um, come along and um, watch the video that we get when we put up on the site. Um, so without any further ado, it's the Integration Down Under, the Azure Integration Services Announcements from Ignite 2020. Here's my details if you want to get in touch with me. For an agenda tonight, what we're going to do is we've I've got some general announcements that aren't really related to integration services, but they do have an effect on some of the integration services. So I want to go through those. Then we're going to look at the announcements around Logic Apps. We'll look at the announcements around API management. And we'll look at the uh, a little bit around the Azure functions. And because my Twitter, hag, Twitter tag is still BizTalk Bill, um, we've got to have a little bit about some BizTalk stuff. So we will have a little bit around the um, BizTalk um, migrator. And I'm going to just drop off my camera so that um, we can uh, get a little bit more on the screen on the recording. So. The, in the general announcements, basically, we have Azure availability zones are now available in Australia East. And I know the first question I heard somebody ask after that announcement was, oh, when are they going to be in Australia Southeast? Um, from what I've understood, um, Microsoft is just making a push at the moment to make sure that the availability of zones are in at least one of the regions of each region pair. So for Australia East, Australia Southeast, availability zones are going to be available in Australia East. We'll have a quick look at that when I get done with this slide. They're also adding some new app service SKUs. Then there's some um, V2 ones out there now. These are V3 and they do have a bit more memory and they're both for Windows and Linux. The app service um, have also announced the ge general availability of the Windows containers. Um, it's been out there for a while, and I've actually started using it with one of my clients. Uh, so basically, you've got an option there of deploying into an app service or in using a container to deploy. The app service environment three um, in development will be launched around November 1st. It's supposedly going to be a lot easier to spin up. Um, and I think with easier, they're also talking a little bit cheaper. So that'll be good too. Also, one of the things that came out of Ignite was the Azure communication services. Now, at the moment, it's US, but it's got some really interesting stuff with tel te telephony and some SMS stuff. So that's going to be really good in terms of that. So let me hop over to the virtual machine that I've got out here. And what I'll do is that we'll look at the, uh, let's go to, that's the functions. That's not the screen that I wanted. Let's see what we got. Okay, here's what I want. 
so I've created the storage uh, account in Australia East and it is zone redundant. So that means what they've done is they've actually split the data center in Sydney into two kind of separate um, configurations. So they've got separate power, separate cooling, separate internet connectivity inside of the same data center. So that means that you can have that the same as you had when you were going from Sydney to Melbourne with your storage, with a globally redundant storage, but now you have it zone redundant in the same data center in Sydney. And as that, as you would expect, you don't get that geographic separation, but you also don't have the latency involved. And one of the interesting things about that is if we look at this slide, you'll see that we've got um, the zones that are redundant, but you also see the Azure storage objects Availability um, is 12 nines. I'm not sure how you get that kind of calculation, but because those are highly available and it's very low latency between the two components, you've got a, um, a big gain there in terms of having that highly available storage um, with that redundancy between. Again, it's not geographically redundant, so but it is zone redundant. The other one is we can now go here and create a web app, and you'll see that we have a choice in here of making it code and either Linux or Windows. And at the moment, Microsoft's recommendation, if you're building .NET Core applications, is to have them um, running on Linux. Um, I have been doing some work with that at the, at the moment, and you will find out there are a few issues around the way Application Insights works and a few things you have to do with Application Insights. But the other one you've got, you've got this option here now that you can use a Docker container, and that can be either a Linux Docker container or a Windows Docker container. Um, and then basically on the next page, when you go through this configuration, it will ask you, what container you want to use, and you can point it to your Azure container registry or the Docker registry, and then pick, pull which image you want there. And basically, it's just a matter when you deploy, you just tell it what image you want to go in there. And there's a different, in the Azure DevOps, there are different tasks to do that. Um, let's see. Uh, no, that's the, that's the next thing. I'll leave that there for the time being. Let me just hop back to the slides. And let's go to the next one, which is our Logic Apps. Now, this to me is one of the major announcements that they've done for Logic Apps in a very long time. Because basically what they've done is the runtime that Azure Functions was using has been updated and logic apps have been updated to run in that runtime, which the big benefit is that I can now run my logic apps locally in my development environment. I don't have to deploy them to Azure to run them. Um, and then basically also means that because that functions runtime runs in a Docker container, means that I can run that anywhere, any cloud. I can run it on AWS. I can run it in my own data center, wherever. Um, so there's a lot of um, things that come out from that. Also, you're going to be able to run them in a function app on Azure, which means that you get all of the advantages of that function app. So you get the private endpoints, better VNet access, deployment slots, all of those kind of things that we've got now for functions, we're going to be able to leverage for our logic apps. You still have to connect to your Azure subscription if you want to use some of the connectors. But again, the core of your logic app is going to be into running the same as the Azure functions and things like that. So all of those people that didn't like logic apps because you couldn't do local development, um, 
have a look because you can now. Um, the uh, This is a bit more detail about it, this link. I'm going to put the slides up um, to where you can get to those slides. Um, I'll put the link out on the Twitter, and um, I've got them up in my um, BizTalk Bill a website. The other thing that we get by the changes to the runtime is we also get better CICD because right now they've got an extension that's inside of VS Code, which means that I've got all of those pieces that I can do with my normal Git repositories and all that kind of stuff. I'm working in VS Code. I'm starting in VS Code, then I'm deploying to Azure, not the other way around. Also, the they have redone the designer. They heard everybody's comments about the fact that the designer um, was a little bit big for most um, logic apps you were designing. So they've made some of the shapes smaller, easier to configure, um, a little bit more compact. So when you get those bigger logic apps, it's easier to work with them. They've also introduced a stateless version of the logic apps. So it doesn't persist the data after each steps and things like that. So it also, it just makes them run a bit quicker. You do have to kind of restart at the top. You can't really pick up where it left off or anything like that the way you can with the stateful ones. The other thing that you may not be aware of is they're introducing some automation tasks for a lot of the other services in Azure. These are actually logic apps running in the background. Um, and you can actually get to the logic app it's created if you want to enhance it past what they've done. But this is really just a way that they're leveraging logic apps to do some of these automation tasks. Okay, so let's hop out to my virtual machine again and go through a few of these features. Now, I have to say one thing today is that I spent the last about 15 hours trying to get this demo to run. And as it comes down to it, I was working with Anthony today a little bit in the afternoon. What I ended up having to do to get it to run for tonight is created a virtual machine in Azure and installed code, VS Code and the extensions and all of those kind of things to get it to run on my virtual machine. I did not get it running on my desktop because this problem that Anthony's identified here, if you install the older core tools via an MSI, then you installed Node.js and NPM, and then you try to install the latest cool core tools via NPM, it doesn't work. So I kept getting the older runtime, the tools, the Azure Functions run uh, core tools, and that just was driving me nuts. I tried everything. I um, reinstalled the MSI, I uninstalled the MSI, but I finally got to the point where I could get it to run. So this is the new designer. And basically, um, if you follow those steps on that link that's in my slides, you'll get to here, you create a new project and create a workflow. This particular workflow I've created has got an HTTP um, request. You can do schema validation here if you want. I don't have any schema validation turned on it, on it today. And you'll notice that the this information that's here used to pop into underneath this shape. So what they've done, they more have more put, kind of um, made a consistent view of it on the side. Um, and then you'll see that you can go through all of those things like the settings. This is where you would turn on secure inputs, secure outputs, suppress your workflow headers, um, concurrency control, all of those kind of things. You can get a code view of that particular piece. And then there's a little bit of about information. And if you want to add any parameters to your call, you can do that there. Um, then you just basically, I didn't uh, actually end up adding anything there, but let's see what happens if I delete. I'll delete that step. And so what you can do, you can go in here and hit the plus and I can add an action, add a parallel branch. So if I add an action, you'll see that I've got all of those 
actions that are there. Um, and I haven't got all of the ones you would see in the Azure portal because I haven't connected my Visual Studio code to my subscription in Azure. As soon as I connect that to my subscription in Azure, I would get all of the connectors that are available out there or any connectors that are already configured in my Azure subscription. And basically what I've done is if I hit um, delete there and I've just got a, a response message. So basically it's just a very, the, the world's most simplest um, kind of logic app at the moment, just a HTTP receive with a response. So what I can do is I can hit F5 and that's going to build my logic app. Now, everybody was excited about this the first time I saw it. It actually is still going to run the code at runtime. It's not actually going to deploy it as a app. So it's going to do this at runtime. Now, they do need a little bit of work. So you think if you're used to functions, you can go down here and you could just run and push in something to that. That would be really nice. Uh, except what you have to do is you need to go up here to overview of your workflow. And you need to grab this callback URL. Whoops. And then what I've done is I've got another instance of um, VS Code open. Oh, why did, oh, I must have hit enter. Okay, let's bring that all back together. Let me paste in the new one to make, it's probably the same, but I haven't, I didn't want to um, worry about that. So I've got content, Jason, I'm just sending a very simple payload. And then what I can do is I can use VS Code. This is the REST extension in VS Code to call off and I get a 200 back and you'll see I've got all those workflow headers and things like that coming back. And then I've got a response that I've coded in my workflow if we go back and look at the workflow. But now what you'll see is you've got the runtime history. But what I did see, and I don't, I think I have to hit the refresh here to get this latest history. Uh, let's see. Yep, I think that, yep. Oh, sorry about that. That's one thing I didn't do when I built my virtual machine is it's still running UTC time. So it's 8.20 in the morning there. Um, so that's why we see it. But now what I can do is I can go in here and say, show me the run. And you'll see, just nice. like we're used to with Logic Apps, um, you can go here, you can click on it, you can see the input, and then you can go down here to the response, and you'll see that I passed out uh, a 200 with test. And again, I could do any of that same stuff that I did before. You can do as much testing as you want to, and then what you do is you hit Control C, and that gets you out of the runtime. Um, it doesn't get you out of this instance, because you'll notice that instance there, and you can go back to the overview. Now, one of the things that really confused me when I first started looking at this today is if I went to workflow JSON through overview without it being running, guess what? You don't get, a, don't get the URL and you don't get any of the runtime status. So this was a little bit confusing at first. So you just be aware of that. You have to start it up first before you go into there. Now, this is the designer. So if I close the designer here, I can go here to the workflow JSON. And basically you can see there is my workflow. Um, and then what I do is I can close that and then I can say, open the designer. And basically that opens in that designer. I could go in here now if I wanted to and say that the body of the output is basically going to be my body from my receive. And then I could put a content header in here that is, uh, what is it, content type. Actually, I'll, I'm, I'm going to cheat. I'll go back over here and I'll grab that. 
go back over here and put the key there and then get rid of the colon and I'll save that and then I'll hit F5 again start it up wait for that to finish starting just like you would with um, the Azure functions this is what I was having trouble getting this 3.0.2931 updated it was still using a 28 one and i tried everything i could do but on my machine i couldn't figure out how to do that so let me go back there and run this again and I, and you'll see that there is that json now a lot of times you may not want these run flow or workflow headers. So what we can do is we can go back into our logic app, uh, control C to, or go down here, control C, oh, control C, stop that. Um, and then go in there and go to settings, or actually I think it's the settings on this one is that suppress workflow headers. And we've set that, and let's save that. We'll run that again. Those workflow headers are very useful if you're trying to do correlation and things like that and want to track some of that information back. But if this is being exposed through API management, out through front door or something like that, you probably don't want those headers going out. Um, so let's do a send request. And you'll see that got rid of the all of the headers that were showing up in there. Um, so that's um, that's good there. Again, um, this is in public preview now, so you can just go out there and get it. If you follow that link off the slides, you'll be able to see that um, out there. That's pretty much what I wanted to show on the Logic Apps. I really like the fact that I'm going to be able to work inside of Visual Studio Code on my machine, be able to debug and test. Um, I haven't figured out how I set breakpoints yet, but hopefully that um, I've just missed something there and we can set breakpoints in there and have a look at that. So next one we're going to go talk about is we'll talk about API management. So if anybody's built fairly complex policies in API management, debugging them have, has been extremely um, painful. So um, what they've done is they've now got, they've updated the VS Code extension for API management to allow you to debug the policies in real time. Now, all people have already complained that, oh, we need to be able to debug into our production instance. So we need something besides developer tier. Um, I don't think that you're going to get premium debugging in premium anytime soon, just because the nature of how premium run can run multiple instances and things. But again, um, what I've added is I've added the links to those pieces. Also, they've added support for Dapper, which is basically those um, Dapper applications. And basically they've done most of that support in the policies. So there's three new policies that will support help support the dapper um, coming through that. And it basically, it will also work in that self-hosted gateway. So you can have a look at those. Not a lot of stuff um, came out of API management at Ignite because they've been kind of doing a pretty good flow of updates all the year, all long, all year along. And they do pretty much a monthly update to keep everybody um, up to date on that. So the next one is the Azure functions. So you know how they have brought the logic apps down to the function runtime. They've now brought the connectors from logic apps to functions. So now it's really, you can use the connectors in your logic app, you can use your connectors in your functions. So now it's really up to you if I want to work in functions or I want to work in logic apps. So they've got the API connect connections as a service. 
That's a new um, CAAS. I haven't seen anybody refer to it as that yet, but it's CAAS, so connection, Connections as a Service. Um, the initial private preview that's out there has the mostly the Microsoft connectors. They haven't got a lot of the third-party connectors available, but they've got the Microsoft connectors. Um, and it's a private preview, but you can just basically the link at the bottom of that slide, you can go to that um, and then they'll send you an invite to the GitHub repository they're building that on. It'll be, um, they're free in preview, but they will be throttled to prevent abuse of them. And again, um, I try, was trying to think about getting a demo ready for this and it is fairly complex. So basically, um, if you go out to the, the functions live webcast they do on a monthly basis, the last one that was the one that was done at the end of September has a good demo in there of the connect, connections as a service. A few other things they've added um, is Blazor support for the static web apps, .NET and Python function support for the static web apps. Um, Jeff Holland, when he was on the, the monthly call, mentioned that if they're in the process of scaling down your function app, say you're on a consumption plan, you've got a bunch of them in there, you're scaling down, there, was, there is some existing issues with the way it does Service Bus. And I think one of the other guys um, that I know here in Melbourne um, was having issues that if the service bus connector scaled, you scaled it back down to zero using the managed service identity to connect to service bus and you tried to scale back up, it wouldn't connect. So there is a, an outgoing, uh, there's an ongoing bug for that at the moment. And that's on the consumption service, the non-premium consumption service. But Jeff said they're doing lots of work in how that um, service bus um, works when it's they're actually scaling down. Now, what it's not available yet, but one of the real exciting things um, that I've seen is this Open API Swagger functions generator. So if you've got a Swagger file of what your APIs are supposed to look like, and you want to create functions out of it, you can run this tool that when it, when they get it out and it will generate your project in Visual Studio Code along with the models that you need for the incoming documents and the outgoing documents or messages and basically gives you everything you need to get started to build your functions. So it kind of stubs out all the functions, builds the models. So that's gonna be a really interesting thing for those people that kind of design their APIs up front in Swagger and open API spec and then they want to generate the functions from there. So this is going to be a really good um, tool that's going to be available for people to be able to um, start from there and um, generate. And again, there is the private preview for the connectors as a service. The next thing I want to talk about, um, BizTalks, I've been doing BizTalk now since the 2000 and 2000 release, probably 2001, so almost 20 years, not quite, but almost 20 years. Um, the BizTalk product group is working on a tool or a set of tools to turn your BizTalk application into Azure integration service solution. So um, this is not going to be any black magic that just automatically does things and they just all work. This is going to be a good way to start. Um, I've been playing with it over the last couple of weeks. I've got a hold of a private preview, but the public preview should be out shortly. Um, it is going to be open sourced. So it will be on GitHub open sourced. So you can fork theirs and you decide that you want to support things that it doesn't support, you're more than welcome to do that. It works with all versions of BizTalk from 2013 R2. And the first question I had from one of my clients was, will it do 2010? Um, talking to um, Valerie at the, in the Microsoft product group, they haven't tested it with 2010, but the 
basic MSI structure hasn't changed between 2010 and 2013. So they're thinking it should work. So now also um, it takes a little while to run and, and we'll, I'll do a little bit of a demo for that as we get into it. Here are some more details around it. So basically it parses the MSI files. It builds a model of all the BizTalk artifacts and generates a report. Okay, the, um, the thing is, if you've got BizTalk applications that depend on each other, okay, so we've always built app, BizTalk applications a lot of times where you had some common stuff, maybe some ins and outs, and then some processing stuff, and they were all in different BizTalk applications. What you'll need to do is you'll need to run this tool and put all of those MSI files in one run. So it's able to find that references and find all of those things in there um, to be able to do that. The, what they've got out there now will support the file adapter FTP and HTTP. I think they're finding the WCF stuff a little bit complex and also how they do that in Logic Apps is gonna be interesting. The pipelines, they've got XML receive, XML transmit, pass through receive, pass through transmit. They have property promotion and demotion. And it'd be interesting to get a um, bunch of BizTalk people in the room and see how many actually knew about property demotion. Uh, I've only used it a, a very few times in all the BizTalk work that I've done. They're also ability to, they have the ability to do maps on both a receive port and a send port. What I'm really interested to look at in when this gets into open source is how hard is it going to be for me to add custom pipelines to this um, supported pipelines? Because the customers that I work with, we've almost always got custom pipelines because we're doing archiving of the messages coming in, archiving of the messages going out. So it's going to be interesting to see how it easy it is to do that kind of piece. They support the XML disassembler, the XML assembler, the XML validator, JSON decoder, JSON encoder, and the flat file decoder. This is the one I really, really is happy to see because the flat file decoder in BizTalk is actually really, really good. Uh, and I've, it's of all the ones I've used across all the different integration technologies that I've used, it is the best. So I'm interested to see on that, um, how easy it is to do that. In orchestrations, um, the private preview that I've got doesn't have the orchestration pieces in it, but it's going to support variables, ports, and ports types, send and receive shapes, and construct and transform shapes, and basically it's going to generate some placeholders in your logic app for those unsupported orchestration shapes. So you'll be able to go in and do things inside of your logic app to do those. They're also going to provide a library of common services in logic apps. So, and what I'm expecting that's going to be is it's going to be an XML receive pipeline logic app that does all of the stuff that a typical XML receive pipeline would do. So it's going to have that capabilities of applying a map and things like that. And you're going to be able to use those common services and common logic apps in any of your integration applications. It's going to be some, some like a toolkit type thing that you're going to be able to leverage. So that's going to be really good, I think, from that. So let's hop into my, uh, Actually, no, we're not going to hop into that. We're going to go here because I've got this on my machine and I really didn't want to install this on my virtual that I just built because I think this is what broke it, but I'm not 100% sure yet. So what we've got here is they, they with the toolkit um, that I got a hold of, they, got a, they have an FTP sample. And basically, it's got a FTP sample. And what you do is I've got a little batch file that will run the converter. And so let's run that. That doesn't take too long to run. 
So it does a migrate, and then basically um, you give it some details about where you want it to be. So it's go, gone off and created things. So if you'll see the inputs that I gave it were the MSI file, um, the primary region, Australia Southeast, and a unique deployment ID, so BC001. Now, um, the first thing I hit when I was playing with this is that Australia Southeast name is makes a few of the deployment IDs fail because it's using ARM templates under the covers for things, and it gives them a deployment name, and that's limited to 64 characters. So by the time they put everything together, um, it was too big. So it, that did cause some issues. Um, I had to go in and do some editing on the, on the, the files it created. Um, so, but basically, that the, what it also does is, let's go have a look. Now, if we look at the one I just ran, it generates an aim and then a, one, a number, and then it has an HTML report. And of course, that report just popped up on my other screen. So let's bring that report over here. Here's the migration report. It tells you what it brought in. And so basically, it gives you details of what was in there. Um, and then the it basically shows you there is the pass through um, application, the receive location, receive port, send port, some subscription information, um, and then it built some message bus stuff, which is pieces that it puts into API management. And then there's some Azure functions and some deployment scripts, um, some logic apps. Key Vault, some storage accounts, and then it's got the another application, which is our pass-through, which is our receive port and our send port. Um, and then there is a system application, which has got some um, deployment scripts and a resource group around that. Um, what I haven't had a chance to look at with this yet is how this actually plays out um, if I want to do multiple non-dependent applications. Is it going to want to create an instance of API management and things like that for everyone? And what it does from there is that if we go in here and look, there in this conversion, there is a deploy all script and a tear down all script. And then there's the application pieces, so the aim pass through. It's got basically um, a bunch of PowerShell scripts that it runs that are all connected to that. Um, and then let's see if we look at one of those with, um, let's look at it with code. Let's see if code comes up, which screen code is decided to come up on. Hold on a second. Let me just wait for that to come up. So uh, if I move that over there now, we will we'll see that it's a PowerShell script and with a resource group and then um, a bunch of names. And you'll see that Australia Southeast makes a lot of those names very, very long, which um, can cause problems. So basically, what I ended up doing is I went in there and I had to go in there and shorten that. Uh, the first time I made a mistake of just changing everything that was Australia Southeast. And that didn't work very well because there's some file names in some of the scripts that have the word Australia Southeast in them. So the, for the deployment stuff, I went in and I just changed um, dot Australia Southeast to AUSE and a dot. So. I did all that, and then basically you can fire up that, and let me just see if I've got uh, where I've got the, so, uh, okay, whatever I did in that last bit of changes was not a good idea.
So this is where I ran it. So I did my Azure accounts, log, got logged on to that, and then I did my deploy all PowerShell in the terminal down here, and it runs off and creates a bunch of these things, but that's failed. So again, um, there's going to be a bit of work around that uh, to figure out uh, a better way to um, do that, especially with those resource group names that are so big. So it may be something that um, gets fixed in that um, scripting so that those you can give alias names to things um, so that they don't generate really long names. Um, but the idea behind this is if we go into, let's go back into my virtual machine and we go back into my Azure portal. I think it's in the other one of these. Um, uh, let's see if it, there it is. What it does is it creates those three resource groups, and you can see how long those names are. And then basically it's got, for this particular client, there's some system applications in here, which you see is API connector, connectors and um, service bus namespaces. And then if we go back into there, we've got that um, message bus, and that's got our API management and our app configuration store. Now, another one that I hit with this is that I hit that um, it uses the free tier of application config, um, and you're only allowed one of those in a subscription. I already had one, so that failed. It's got application insight, it's got some functions, it's got an integration account, um, it's got a key vault, so it's pretty full on on the way it's done, doing most of that stuff. Um, and then this is the one for the particular application that I'm doing. And it's got basically those API connectors and kind of those are the, the receive and the send adapters. So that's um, just a quick look at the um, uh, BizTalk migration tool. And again, as we get into public preview and, and further, I, I do plan to have another um, meeting around that. So, and, and we may actually even kind of do either an online hack or something like that, that would get us um, the ability to um, be able to um, help some people do some conversion and get them all set up to do it and show them what they can do and see how that works. I will warn you that first time you do that, or when you do that deployment, it takes a while because it creates an instance of API management, which usually takes about 30 minutes, depending on if you're having a good day or a bad day. So um, you could have, it could take you a while. So here are my details again, if you need to get a hold of me, uh, if you've got any questions that you want to take offline or whatever, around um, the BizTalk um, migrator tool, things like that, be, be, feel free to um, reach out to me. So, and if you've got any questions, I will turn my, turn my video back on. So um, there is that Q&A um, section in the um, Zoom meeting. So, okay, I've got one in there. Um, for BizTalk Migrator, is support for BizTalk Accelerator in pipeline? I am specifically looking for HL7. Um, I, the answer so far is no, as far as I know for the HL7 stuff. There is a lot of people looking for a better way to do HL7. Now, um, I know this is not BizTalk or the functions and things like that, but um, there is a HL7, um, or not an HL7, but a Fire um, application out there in the marketplace that will do HL7 to Fire translation. It's got a database. It can use either a SQL database. It can use a Cosmos DB, all of those kind of things to do that conversion. And it just like depends that. on um, what exactly you're looking to do. And also seems like they're working on... Uh, I can't, um, you're really soft. 
Oh, strange. Better? Hello? No? Oh, forget it. So, um, I can yeah, hear you, Wagner. It's just a little bit soft. Oh, okay. okay. I'll try to, to speak up. Yeah, so um, read, feel free to reach out. I've done a little bit of work for it. We had one customer that was a little bit interested in it, so I actually went out and spun it up. Um, and it's um, because the fire stuff has got a lot of security behind it, there's a lot of security overhead in it because it's trying to make sure everything is encrypted and all that kind of stuff. So it is a little bit, um, uh, a little bit um, cumbersome in, in, that, in that term. But it, uh, it is out there and it, it does do most of the HL7 stuff and converts it into the fire format. And it builds you a database that you can actually use to query that stuff out of there. Um, do we have any other questions? Yes. Uh, Bill, what, what version of, uh, what tier level of the integration account does it create? Um, that's a really good question. <laughs> Hold on, and let me... Uh, while on that, what is the API management as well? Uh, let's go in, I think it was, which one was it in? It was in this one. Um... Okay. Well, we have a great pricing tier there, so it, it is at least basic, right? Yeah, it, um, uh, where do I, oh, I know how, how I can. Um, uh, properties, maybe. It's the free tier. So you'll have the same problem if you've got more than one of those, I think, in a region. Yeah, it feels That's, like a, a lot of uh, uh, parameterization. They're going to need to, to add that to say what is going to be the tiers that you wanted to, to spin up on that yeah. kind of stuff. I think, um, yeah, that's going to have to be part of it because, I mean, um, there are going to be things in there that you have to um, work around. Mm -hmm. in this that. Kind of limit on the maps, number of maps and things like that you can put in a free tier, right? Yeah, there is. So, but I think, um, but I think it would I be it would be just a matter of going into the um, going into those um, files that it creates. Um, so, like if you go into there's the application, if you do the message bus. Um, oh, actually, wait a minute. Which one was it in? Let me just go. Yeah, it might back. actually be on on the parameters of the, uh, uh, then of yeah. that particular ARM template. So you should yep. be able to change it at the, uh, before you deploy. Yeah. So um, what I was going to show is that most of that stuff is embedded. Um, I'm not sure which one. Yeah, it'll be in your edit. There's a, um, there's a parameters file there at the top of that. Yeah, but th there, there's a hundred parameter files in here. <laughs> <laughs> Integration account name, that should be a good place to start. Um, so there's a parameter file for that. Um, but that's probably not the one that's creating it. Probably if I search for free. <laughs> So this is the um, parameters for an artifact store dev, um, and it's got a skew of free. So I'm sure if we go look at the um, that actual ARM template that this is parameters for, you'll be able to um, see. And it's surprising that they didn't put the other SKU values in there as, as um, oh, actually, they may have it in the, let's go and go back to the files, artifact store dev, that's the JSON, um, should be in here. So there's the SKU. And then if we go down and find the SKU, yep, this is an integration account, and that's the SKU name for that. 
Um, so you would just go in and update that SKU in there mm -hmm. for that. The other, thing, the other thing with that is you, you, should, you probably should be able to things like API management and stuff like yeah, that. So create a, a common one and start to, to redeploy those things against the same one. Yep. So, um, yeah, hopefully, um, and again, this is a private preview that I got a hold of. So it's not, um, they've got, it's not as full featured as what they're going to be releasing. Mm -hmm. um, so there will be, will be some stuff in there. As you can tell, it does generate a fair bit of stuff. So there's a lot of PowerShell scripts. There's a lot of um, ARM templates with parameters. So you've got all of those different ones. But what they have done is pretty much they've created a separate ARM template for each one of the resources. So I'm, I'm guessing that when you get the open source, you'll be able to go out to the open source and be able to go in here and tweak what these um, look like and be able to go in there and say, okay, I know I'm always going to use this particular tier of of this particular service, or I'm hoping they're also going to have an ability at that point to let you reuse. So here's the name of my API management instance. Here's the name of my integration account, as opposed to trying to generate one every time. So if so. they at least make those deployments, uh, uh, what is the name? Not, not conditional, uh, uh, cumulative. Right, I can remember the, the the name that you have of that. So instead yeah, so, of like uh, always rewrite, uh, if it exists, just don't deploy. That might solve a lot of problems already. Yeah, so it'll be interesting to see what they do with that at that point. And again, Valerie stressed to me this is not going to be a tool that you blindly run and just deploy everything. Mm -hmm. There's going to be some work involved. Supposedly that FTP one, when I get it running with every, all the names correct and everything, you can drop a file at a location, it will pick it up, it'll process it through, and it'll output it back out. And it uh, will- so that, that report it generates, the HTML, is that after it's deployed to Azure, or is it after you just run the tool in it? That's just the tool report. Right, so that's your what if scenario. So before you actually hit deploy and start yeah, running so up your subscription costs, you can see. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that this one's got all green stuff. And I'm assuming if it hits stuff that it doesn't like or doesn't know about, you're going to have some reds in there. So, that would be nice. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's, there'll be a bit, bit of that going on in there. And so, to be honest, he's trying to replicate the stock, right? So. Yeah. You know, I know so um, because I, I, re I remember a couple of the MVPs from the UK were start had started this project uh, three, four years ago when Logic Apps first came out. So um, it'll be interesting to see how close it is to what they were thinking about. And again, um, if it does, um, what I'm looking at with a couple of clients is I'm looking at uh, what um, it looks like in terms of getting me started on just a basic application that doesn't have a lot of stuff in it, just basically moving files or doing simple transforms. I'll be looking at trying to do those first. And those then when, um, the other stuff, uh, when we get a little bit more um, familiar with this tool, get a little bit uh, more familiar with how to customize this tool, is to go on from there. And the other thing is also run that just to have like the skeleton and then see where you can do the, the, the uh, React Actual. Yep. Right. The, the, uh, take a look at what it does with the, the, the actual orchestrations and then some of those receive locations and see, try to get some of those patterns and, and apply to, to React Actual. Yeah, that, that's more, true. More complex as well, uh, as well. So I think one thing you'll find is that if you're starting from scratch with a Logic App, and not going this tool, you won't have near as many moving parts mm -hmm. because they're trying to um, basically break your BizTalk solution into the, the individual parts so that they can basically combine those parts to make a solution. So that's yeah. going to be some of the stuff because I think that having a, a receive FTP 
logic app and the send FTP logic app. You may have you may have one when you get done. Um, um, and also, I think that there is some there is some stuff in here. I haven't had a good look at it, but there is some stuff in here that will manage restarts of messages. So there's a some of the stuff um, there was, I think, in the FTP one, there's a little website that gets created that will let you manage suspended messages. Uh, that that is going to be interesting nice. on, on having something to, to, to use on that. Yep. Like so use that pattern and, and apply to, to normal applications might be quite uh, interesting. Yeah. So there's going to be a lot of building blocks in here, I think, that are going to be helpful. Mm -hmm. But um, let's see, do we have any more questions? If not, I think that's uh, there what... is one last from from. The oh, yep. You okay. Have to guess when do you think the stock migration tool will be out for public review? Um, next week. Okay, so there we go. <laughs> um, because they were really pushing hard to get it out by ignite. <laughs> um, be, but. Uh, they didn't realize because they're making it an open source project, there was a few extra hoops they had to jump through to make that work. Um, so I, the, um, the feeling I get um, every time I talk to them is it's a day or so away. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, uh, Vivek, in, in yep. the worst case scenario, by the end of the, the, the month, we should have uh, uh, something, and if any one of us know about it, we we make sure that we yeah, you'll you'll see Twitter. me tweet about it as soon as, yeah. it, as it goes public preview. And if I if I uh, uh, do that, I'll make sure that I, that I'll ping you. I think you are on on my yep. list. And then then the big thing will be where when we get to a point of basically um, um, being able to actually um, show people what it looks like when you run it against a real solution. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm hoping, hoping for. So, okay. Um, thank everyone for attending. And again, like I said, the slides or the recording will be up on the, um, website, um, shortly. So hopefully before sometime between now and the weekend, uh, it'll be up on there. So if you've got other people that want to have a look at that, Thanks. So. And thanks, Bill. I had missed that uh, the uh, app services for Windows container being GA. And uh, the, uh, I just shared that with uh, uh, my team because we have a project that was running uh, uh, that in production on preview. So yep. they, they're going to be relieved now. And it's also the available in Australia Southeast that was not before. Yep. So I was okay. like, uh, uh, checking here. Okay. So thanks, everybody, for attending.